already, everybody. Thanks for your patience and the pause. So we're going to move on to our next speaker. Um, next we have David Goodis Cross, who is a native of Wisconsin and University of Wisconsin Madison alum. Graduated in 2008 with a BS in forest and wildlife ecology. Um, he explored landscape scale avian malaria dynamics in New Zealand for his master's. And in true generalist fast fashion, now studies remote sensing and regional forest classification in the Northeast, along with forest health methods and trends in Vermont. For his PhD here at UVM, um, advisor is Jeff Pontius. Um, take it away. Thank you, Kathleen. Thanks to all of you wonderful people for showing up to my talk today. Um, I'm going to be discussing one of the projects I'm working on under the guidance of Jen Pontius who Kathleen mentioned, and also with invaluable help from Alison Adams, who will be speaking with you shortly. Stick around. And this project is really on improving our large-scale forest mapping across the entire Northeast um, by integrating some advanced remote sensing techniques, namely pixel-based spectral and mixing and object-based image analysis using multi-temporal Landsat imagery. And so what do I mean by improve large-scale forest mapping? Well, we're really trying to produce 30 meter by 30 meter pixel percent basal area maps for key tree species or genera across the region, which are listed here to your right. And this is, this is new, exciting stuff. This hasn't really been done, large-scale forest mapping of structure, especially not down to the species or genus specificity. That's sort of the holy grail of large-scale remote sensing, is getting to that uh, species or genus level. So this is really new, exciting stuff, but as somebody whose dissertation work depends on it and hasn't really been done, that's really exciting, but it's also a little bit terrifying, right? Because uh, we don't know how well it's going to perform. Um, so we'll also be producing sort of your traditional forest thematic classification maps from this work. And then comparing what we get there to existing large-scale data sets which are out there, which actually leave showed, I think, NLCD was one of them. Um, and for the focus of this talk, I'm really going to hone in on this percent basal area map production, mainly using our pixel-based spectral and mixing. And I just want to contextualize this a little bit. Well, this is part of a larger project. We're actually mapping this from 1985 and five-year time steps all the way up until now. I'm really going to focus this talk on our initial results from 2014. And there are sort of myriad applications for this data. I've highlighted a few here, uh, looking at tree species distributions and forest structure changes over time, um, quantifying some forest ecosystem services, which Allison will talk about in the context of forest carbon storage, and then uh, looking at sort of wildlife and invasive insect and pathogen habitat and host locations and modeling those. So why do we need to uh, improve our large-scale forest mapping in the Northeast in general? Well, there's sort of two things available, or I've classed these into sort of two available um, data sets some are very coarse, like National Land Cover Database, which I think we've seen in a few presentations already. Those are only typing out to deciduous forests, evergreen forests, mixed forests. And they're still with very region, uh, marginal regional accuracy rates, down around 50% in the Northeast. Um, but it is some of the best temporal resolution we have available. Uh, NLCD has been mapped out in, I think, three different time steps now. But the National Forest Type Dataset is an example of a specific classification out there, and that's produced by the Forest Service from FIA field data and some remote sensing. And they've actually mapped down to species level or species assemblage. Here you see maple, beech, birch. But again, super low accuracy rates, and they come with these caveats, like the data should not be displayed at scale smaller than 1 to 2 million, which is the scale you see here. They really don't want you to be digging into those pixel-based estimates. Why? 20% uh, accuracy for most <laughs> fur, but apparently amazing at pitch time. Look at that, 100%. Um, probably two pixels. Um, but uh, they're you know relatively good at the species assemblage, which is I think you know pretty important. The maple beech birch they're doing all right at. A uh, brief reminder before we really jump into the methods here of what the Landsat thematic mapper and enhanced thematic mapper sensors actually collect in terms of data, and it's seven band imagery. Um, that spans from the visible wavelengths into the infrared. Band 6 is actually way over here. Um, it's a thermal imaging band that doesn't quite fit on the scale. But we don't use that too much because it's also at a 60 meter resolution. We're really concerned, especially in this 3 to 5 band region, because you can see from these spectral reflecting spheres, that's where we can really parse out vegetation. And just to remind you folks of this talk, is going to be on path 14, which spans parts of New York, Vermont, and sort of the Montreal region. So take a second to soak this in. This is our whole pixel-based uh, processing workflow. 
to get to it from imagery or multi-temporal imagery to our species basal area rasters, I really wanted to highlight on this right away that we create this sort of pseudo hyperspectral image with we stack 50 bands together from this multi-temporal imagery and some derived indices, and then we apply this spectral and mixing algorithm, which is typically reserved for hyperspectral imagery. Um, so we're trying to sort of mimic that process uh, with this multi-temporal imagery. And that, that's, it's a, it's a really new novel technique. It's only really been done on very small scales and usually not using Landsat imagery. So Landsat imagery, what does that really look like? Well, here I've shown you sort of um, our seasonal, phenologically representative images that we collect within each year. And so you can see here I've, I've put color infrared images where shades of red really represent active actively photosynthesizing vegetation. You can see changes throughout the year are pretty prevalent. So you've got this wealth of spectral information when it comes to um, vegetation. Then we, uh, we, we apply some standard pre-processing -pre steps like uh, radiometric calibration and some atmospheric corrections. We mass clouds. Um, anybody who's worked with Landsat in the eastern mountain regions knows that clouds are a pretty major issue. Um, so we've tried to get around that by buffering um, are the years that we can choose images from, two years around each time step. Um, so we're assuming there's not a lot of change in forest cover over that time. Then we derive some really useful indices for parsing out different land cover types. We've got NDVI in the top left here, but we also have this tassel cat transform, which gives you these uh, pixel-based indices of brightness, wetness, and greenness. And you can say, see that they're really good at parsing out, especially if you look at tassel cap brightness here, really good at picking out impervious surfaces. NDVI also really good at getting uh, at these differences in land cover type. And some of these other ones are actually uh, really helpful in terms of parsing out deciduous from evergreen forest. So once we have all that seasonal imagery and those indices, we're stacking all of that together to create our 50 band image, along with some seasonal tassel cap differences that we calculate. And there's our sort of pseudo hyperspectral image that we then plug in to a, a PCA, Principal Components Analysis, which knocks down, sort of accounts for the 99% of that spectral variability and really identifies your, your spectrally distinct regions, which you can really see here in this image. Typically results in two to five bands out of that 50. And then we stack those two to five bands back on top of our summer imagery, which contains a wealth of spectral information for vegetation. And then our seasonal tassel cap differences, and then we run it into this thing called the minimum noise tra uh, fraction transform, which is just another sort of cascading PCA, but it's a, it's a prerequisite to the spectral and mixing. And again, that sort of gives you a very spectrally distinct image. You can see I missed a little cloud there. Um, so feed that into the spectral and mixing process, and this is really so the power of spectral and mixing is that we can get below the pixel level, we can get the subpixel level abundances. How do we get there? Well, we train it to what pure pixels are, what end members we want it to identify, end members in this context being our tree species or genus. Um, and we do that by training it with field plots, which we, the FIA was gracious enough to grant us. Um, and also we use some Vermont Monitoring Cooperative in, uh, Inventory data to identify um, plots where you have greater than 80% basal area for a given species. And so that's calibrating this algorithm that identifies those target spectra for each species. And that's plugged into this mixture to and match filtering, which um, results in this sort of feasibility map with red uh, representing where your species is likely present, teal is where it's likely absent, and white, like along here, is where it's uh, likely to be false positive. But since we've got the subpixel level proportions of our target spectra, we can get at relative abundances of tree species at pixel level. Then we plug this output into some multiple linear regression to generate these species-specific basal area equations, which we then apply through band math in a GIS environment to get this species basal area raster. So what does that look like? Well, any good talk in Vermont is going to start with sugar maple. Um, and I've sort of color-coded these by green we did all right. And so the general um, format I'm going to use for the, the results here is to show you the regression results up here in the top left, some accuracy, accuracy statistics on the map down here in the bottom left. And then this is a continuous distribution of basal area, so from virtually none and then in the warmer colors where it's really high. So for sugar maple, we do tend to overpredict a little bit. A little bit. We have a pretty high false positive rate, uh, relatively speaking, but our, our true positive rate on precision is really good. 
And as you can see, it sort of it makes sense. You, you see higher proportions of sugar maple sort of along the base and slopes of the Green Mountains as well as in the Adirondacks. And uh, I, to sort of amplify that, I've plucked out where I think species, uh, sugar maple is dominant. So I've identified that as greater than 50% of the basal area in a given pixel. And again, it sort of just highlights where the, those mountain areas, those mountainous areas, mountain bases, mountain slopes, and again around here in the, in the uh, western portion of the Adirondacks. I've also zoomed in to give you a sense of the uh, sort of spatial detail of this data. Uh, got the Shelburne Pond here, the Winooski River, and Camel's Hump State Park. If you look down at Camel's Hump State Park, sort of a hot spot for sugar maple, and sort of uh, middling abundances here in the more developed and, and uh, <coughs> upland parts. So red maple, how did we do? Well, we're really good at telling you where it's not, um, and not quite as good at telling you, or predicting it across the landscape. But I think it's interesting to note here that the red maple distribution kind of mirrors sugar maple a little bit, but just at lower percent basal areas. And to amplify that, so you see it's kind of a similar distribution, but you do tend to see red maple more sort of along these wetter areas, and perhaps in poorer site qualities, which you, you kind of see here. There's a lot of development around here, a lot of agriculture, and it's in these small forest patches or in between there. So maybe generally poorer site qualities. Um, Again, a little hot spot down here. Beach, we also did pretty well on, but beach we found just isn't really um, a dominant part of the landscape. You see really low basal areas, but it is distributed sort of throughout the path. Um, precision, not so good. We're about 50% in terms of uh, our predicted yeses mac matching our actual yeses on the ground. Um, really good at telling you where it's not. Um, and our true positive rate is pretty good. And perhaps American Beach is a bit of a misnomer because we've got a hot spot up here in Canada. Um, it's not kosher, I don't think. But um, zooming in a little bit here, Champlain Valley is sort of not a lot of dominance in terms of uh, the percent basal area for beach. Some some hot spots here where you're seeing more red maple, um, but generally speaking, not a lot. A little bit down here in Camel's Hump State Park. Okay, now we're getting into species that have a few issues. Poor red spruce always seems to have issues. Um, our issue with red spruce is in this sort of precision and positive rate, true positive rate, we're not really good at predicting where it is. We're sort of middling in terms of predicting where it is on the landscape, but we're excellent at telling you where it's not. And that, I think, is a product of just, look at that. There's just not a lot out there, um, especially when you're talking about in terms of dominance or percent basal area on a pixel basis. And this. It's, a, it's an error on our part. This is not the gateway to spruce them. <laughs> this, is, this is an edge effect from uh, a Landsat image that didn't overlap in our stack. And I need to go back and correct that. Um, zooming in, you do see some red spruce over here by Shelburne Pond. Um, other than that, you've got, I mean, you've got some along by the Winooski here, <coughs> around 60%, but generally not a big part of uh, Champlain Valley. Hemlock. Well, Hemlock's everywhere. No, no. We, this is, uh, I think, a bit of an overprediction, which you can see in our false positive rate. Um, and and anything, anytime you get a true positive rate that says 100%, I think some red flags come up. Um, Eastern hemlock is a pretty uh, solid component of the northern hardwood forest, but perhaps not this much. You know, we've got it pretty much everywhere, uh, dominating really along the Adirondacks, Champlain, uh, sorry, the Green Mountain chain here. Um, up in the north, around the Northeast Kingdom, it's really everywhere in our model. And I think this is a bit of an overprediction. Probably a product of not having a ton of training pixels. Again, look at that, it's everywhere. I do like that we're seeing it around wet areas, so along the Winooski and around Lake Iroquois here. That's nice. And you don't see it where we saw a lot of maple prevalence. So some not so good results. Had to present those to our balsam fir. Not so good. Down around 40%, 46% overall accuracy, and I think this is largely due to most of our training plots being on top of mountains. And so you've got these really thin canopies, and you've got rock underneath that I think is really affecting our uh, sensor reflectance, what our sensor is measuring. Um, and then red oak is a perfect model. No, no it's perfectly overfit. Um, we, I think this is, we had I think four total pixels in that entire region for um, training data. 
for fewer pixels. Um, so this is a model that's overfit. To address this, we just need to find some more pure stands of red oak, which is really, really hard in the Northeast. Finally, there's this, uh, from our 2000, our more recent time steps, there's this Landsat 7 uh, sensor line correction failure where you've got these, these literal lines with no data. And we've tried to get around that by backfilling with uh, phenologically similar dates. Um, but sometimes we just can't because of clouds or other issues, and so you end up with these lines with no data. So finally, when we have these species basal area raptors, that's when we start bringing in object-based classification to refine that, to get away from the pixel level and more up to a forest stand level. And object-based image analysis is really powerful in this regard. It's also really good at bringing in ancillary environmental data to take those species basal area raptors and really refine them based on elevational constraints or soil variable constraints. And so we start with image object segmentation, parse out forest and non-forest, our target species and our non-target species based on those basal area rasters, um, threshold them with some uh, ancillary environmental data to get our refined species basal area raster, which we then produce our chromatic forest classification from. And I just wanted to leave you with what an image object segment looks like for Landsat data. This is the dreaded sensor line correction, these yellow areas, but it seems to be doing a really good job of picking up our spectral variability in the image. With that, thank you. Two questions. One is, what, what is your pixel size? 30 meter by 30 meter. Okay. And the second is, uh, we have uh, 110, 120 kids every year. We send them out into the woods, same patch yeah. every year. Do you have a data set that they can test? Or a particular patch in, in you know, it's a good question. I thought about so I am teaching a remote sensing class in the yeah. spring, and I thought about doing the same thing. Yeah, you yeah. can't steal my ideas. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah uh, we Centennial Woods for UVM students. Have been, yeah, we've also been uh, using NR206, which Margaret Burke here is involved with. Um, where they've been going out and collecting some validation data yeah. for us too. Um, well, we're in Camp Johnson where they burn. I would, yeah, I would yeah. love to do that. Yeah. Um, Especially when we sort of get to the final products and we can really test the value. Well, they're always excited about real world applications. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, I'm, I'm similar in that I work for Fish and Wildlife. I do natural community mapping. Yeah. So I do a lot of both um, looking at air photos, trying to figure out individual trees, and also yeah. doing field work. So, I mean, I, and also, like I was saying earlier with my obsession with my naturalist, I've been in a whole bunch of yeah. species locations. Like, for instance, we have a pretty good um, oak. Uh, we're getting to a pretty good map of where oak is. I would stuff. love. So I would love to see something like that. That really guides where I can go to try to find. I, I do need a, a since it is 30 meter by 30 meter pixels. Right. It does have to be a pretty significant stand of red. Right, and, that, and it, that it doesn't have to dominate the entire pixel. It just needs to be that greater than 80 percent base. But like for instance, we have our um, state significant natural, like the best example of yeah. we know of each natural community. So like the best oak forests, you know. stuff. So anyway, I guess yeah, it's less awesome. a question and more just. Um, <laughs> No, but thank you. Yeah, my yeah. yeah. Social or any topic. Yeah. And for one more, how do you identify the false positives, and do you use training pixels from another geographical area? You know, like where there is a lot of red oak that has a Well, so. Um, yeah, getting back to the false positives are really predicted um, in the, in the stats program that we use. Um, it runs. This, these contingent, it produces these contingency tables, which is like 100 random points. It, it <clears throat> sees how well your classification does. And the false positives, I always, I always mix this up, it's basically um, where your actual data doesn't match what it's supposed to be. So if it's saying your false positive, if you're saying, um, if you're predicting it as a yes, and it's actually a no, that's a false positive. And what was the other one? Sorry. The other one was, could you use training pixels from an area that would have a lot of red oak from a different geographical region? Uh, I think we'd be hesitant to do that because of um, different site general site soil. characteristics and soils are a major one. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much.